Hi, Happy New Year. JJ, I've got JJ back here again, John Jens, and um, we are looking at some of Australia's greatest charades, but in context, because one bottle at a time is super cool, but it's not actually that interesting until you put them into context and you work out what you like and how much you like it and why. I really agree, absolutely and totally. So in the old days, and you know, 30, 40 years ago, if an Australian was travelling overseas, an Australian winemaker was travelling overseas to sell wine, the first question and the most important question he was asked every time was, do you have a Shiraz? Do you have it with you? Um, Australia's exports were based on Shiraz. And although we only produced 3% of the world's wine, um, we exported an enormous amount of it. And we were one of the largest suppliers in the UK and the largest suppliers into, into America. Unbelievable from 3%, but, but true. Um, these are the styles of wine that created imagery about it. And we've got here a cross section of single vineyard wines and blended wines and tiny producers and some of the iconic producers. These are amongst the best of what Australia does. And um, in general, in the last four or five years, last two or three years of these releases, um, actually it's probably the last two or three years since they've been released, the, each of these producers have produced the greatest wines, in my opinion, that they ever have. Winemaking is getting better. Fruit is getting better, depending on new technology and new knowledge in both areas. I reckon the wines are getting better and better. Um, and I think really interestingly for me, we're looking at it not just a cross-section of um, like producer sizes and, and sourcing arrangements, but also we're looking at different alcohols, different oak treatments, um, different regions. And I think they're really important when we consider the overall style of the wine. So let's just dive in and we're just going to unpick things as we go because there's a lot to discuss. So starting in the first glass, we've got the 2021 Tyrrell's Eight Acres Shiraz. Um, this is part of the Sacred Site range and they're very difficult to get. They're very hard to get. You've got to be on the mailing list, but the mailing list is tiered. You've got to be in the top tier to get your allocation, uh, and then you can purchase them. The wines are cheap, extraordinarily cheap for, for what they are. I mean, the vines for this vineyard were planted in the 1890s. Just wild, really beautiful old stuff. You can see here I've got the old patch, the four acres and Jono's, and you know some of the vines here go back to the 1879 for the four acres. So really, really old vine material and picked at a really sensitive time. 13.3% alcohol makes it the lowest on the table. And for me, it's just pure and clear. There's red fruits, red snakes, peppercorn. It's got this gorgeous flow of... If anybody's overseas, are they going to know what red snakes are? Oh, you know, jellies, like the, the jelly lollies. Lollies are a different word in America too, you know, sweets. They keep changing it in my tasting notes to lollipop. I'm like, it's not lollipop. <laughs> Very <laughs> different. <laughs> Sweets. <laughs> anyway, I like gummies. Um, it's got that real raspberry character. But the good thing about Hunter Valley, the beautiful thing about it, is you get this flow of ferruginous tannin, which is ferrous and, and rust. And it's beautiful, but super fine and bloody. And that's what you get here. It's balanced and complete and just sensational. And I love it. I love it. Like, I want to drink it, which is ultimately the best compliment you can give a wine. Okay, so for me, our big uh, wine, our big Shiraz producing region, actually our big Shiraz producing uh, state is South Australia, easily and clearly. There are finer, more elegant varietal styles in Victoria and Tasmania and a little bit in Western Australia, but the Hunter Valley and New South Wales is a revelation, but only if you can never get to find the wines. Um, I've asked Erin about these recently because she's seeing more of them than I am. She's talking about McWilliams and she's talking about Tyrrells. Not McWilliams. Well, yes, Mount Pleasant. Oh, oh, oh Pleasant. Oh, Mount Pleasant. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Sorry, There's good point. A Mount Pleasant. Yeah. And also the Brokenwood um, Graveyard Vineyard. There's some incredible vineyard sites in Hunter Valley producing sensational age-worthy wines. And, and the cool thing about it is that the style, so we're not talking about the quality, but the style in Hunter for Great Hunter Shiraz is slightly lower alcohol than you will find, say, in South Australia, for example. I mean, you're seeing low 13s here. Um, you know, I think Graveyard is 14.5, which is very high for Hunter. Morris O'Shea, Mount Pleasant, excellent wine, also in the mid-14s. These wines are high alcohol for Hunter. They're of a lower style, which I really like. So You can drink more of it. So... I'm 74. When I was young, the wines of these styles and the Mount Pleasant were legendary. You didn't ever see them. Fine, elegant, round, balanced, long, um, very, very finely textural, no obvious tannins. 
And that's exactly what this is. This is this is the generations passing down to this particular wine and this particular style. First time I've tried it, courtesy of Aaron, absolutely stunning. Um, you used um, red, red snakes. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's red berries. Um, delicious sense. I must line up, may sound heretical. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I would have picked it as a French Pinot. I think right. it's delicious, sensational, brilliant finish, brilliant enough to taste. Erin said around about $100. At $100, I'd recommend that to anyone. Great wine. You're going to have to work out how you're going to get on that mailing list, though. Great. I'm very grateful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we need to call Chris Tyrrell is what we need to do. Um, moving into the second wine, this is the 2019 Torbrek Run Rig from Barossa Valley. So the Run Rig vineyard is a single vineyard, um, like the... Eight Acres is a single vineyard, single vineyard wine, and the it's got an inclusion of Viognier, which is co-planted with the Shiraz in that vineyard. Um, this is 15%. This is a big wine from a hot vintage. 19 was the, the first of two very warm and dry vintages, 19 and 20 back to back. Um, and I think you really see that kind of brooding, dense, black, moody, Darth Vader character in this wine. It's huge. An oak, charry, resinous oak. Do we know what the proportion of Viognier is? That's low. It's like 2% Okay. something. It's little. Okay. And, but I've noticed some of those same slippery characters on others of Torbrex wines as well. Do you think some of the others have Viognier in them too? Yeah, some do. I can't remember off the top of my head which they are. Yeah. The thing about Torbrex is the wines are all, it's a style, right? So the Torbrex wines are really big and, and glossy and, and high alcohol. Um, but the fruit is so excellent. And Ian Hongel, the winemaker, is really, he makes really glossy, polished wines. So they're big but they're awesome um so you just have to decide whether or not that style is for you it's not for everyone um it's not for me but i can absolutely and certainly appreciate it and i've given some blistering scores to the the torbrek reds because he just executes it so bloody well very smart wines so i mentioned shiraz and the people overseas the importers overseas wanting australian shiraz this this is the style um, this wine in the past was the style that they wanted. This is a more refined version. You've talked about Ian and what he's doing. Um, and he's obviously a very clever and a very classy winemaker. And um, this is the modern, slightly refined version. So it's still got the power, the fruit, the weight, the density and the length. But the oak handling down either side is, um, I think, better selected, better used. And despite, and we've both known the people from the past who've made the wines there, um, um, 15 and 16 in particular were extraordinary from the great vintages. Right. Um, and um, and I will add that in our restaurants, we have, uh, we, I'm with the Lamont's restaurant group in Perth, Western Australia, um, and our, our customers come from a, basically a very wealthy base, very wealthy suburbs around us. If we give them tour breaks in any one of the given styles and price ranges, they love them. They think they're fantastic. I'm probably a touch ahead on the 2015 and 2016, but this is still a lovely wine in the same style and still one of Australia's better wines. Um, not cheap at um, around about um, 350, 400. Um, very, very good wine. Love it. And everything that Erin said, I agree with in terms of style. Yeah. Moving um, into Western Australia, it's not often that we talk about Western Australia and quality Shiraz in the same sentence. That is changing courtesy of Franklin River. And Swinney, who makes this 2020 Bavi Syrah, is really an important vineyard in the region. So we know that Franklin River is a sub-region of the Great Southern and it is emerging over time. I mean, there are iconic vineyards there that have been around for a long time that have been servicing great wines i.e. Justin Vineyard and the Jack Man from Horton. Great wine, long been a great wine. Um, the Swinney Vineyard is a very big vineyard, but it's man not but, and it's managed very well and um, sells fruit to lots of different producers around Western Australia. So often when a winery is based in another region but makes a Franklin River Shiraz, i.e. a Margaret River winery making a Franklin River Shiraz or a Geograph winery making a Franklin River Shiraz, more often than not, the fruit is sourced from the Swinney Vineyard. So we know that this quality of this fruit across the board is very good. In this wine, these are bush vines, so hand-picked, hand-pruned. They pick the fruit on like a bunch-per-bunch bunch basis, right? Like it's super detailed. Um, the winemakers have a very skilled affinity for grape 
tannin. So they're using um, older, large format oak. So the tannins that you get from this wine are not oak drive, but fruit drive, which I love. 2020 was a warm, like short, fast, loud vintage in WA. Um, low yielding, small berries, thick skins, early ripening, like the whole bit. It was intense. This is a very tannic wine for me. It's quite closed. I really like it. And I love what Franklin River does because it has a really clear expression, regional, regional expression in all of the wines, in the Riesling, in the Syrah, and in more recent times, the Grenache as well. Also um, a Swinney wine. So yeah, like lots to say. Love Franklin River. I think we're really looking at them in their, or at that region in its early stages. I mean, there are producers that have been making wine there for 30 years, but I think that the um, trend is we're at the beginning of it. Okay, so for me. Kind of out of breath there. That was a lot of information, but great, a great, great, great little region. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, so the first vines were planted down there in the uh, middle 60s, and um, as the years went by, and Niran's come back a couple of times to Jack Mann, the great Jack Mann was the great winemaker in this country, in this state for decades, um, and was sort of the godfather of the industry. As time went on, his family continue on these days. They're, they're all winemakers and chefs, the whole family, all of us in it are. But the, um, um, I knew, after looking at wines like Jack Mann and the Abercrombie from Howard Park, that the winemakers who kept saying that Shiraz was the best grape, red grape variety for the region I knew that they were wrong. I couldn't understand why they kept saying it. I could see quite clearly and quite easily that Cabernet was the finest. There's no question at all. And then suddenly the Swinney Vineyards came along. And wines like this and the Grenache from these guys too, which have been brilliantly reviewed both in Australia and overseas. And I finally had to confess, I give up. I waved the white flag. I suddenly realised that despite the quality of those wines, the Syrah and the Grenache, in fact, and as Matt Swinney with his sister Janelle, the owners of the vineyard, which is hundreds of hectares, um, as they say, they believe absolutely and totally, as against my now erroneous view, that the Southern Rhone varietals are the future of the region. This wine and, it, and the Favi, they're not cheap, they're $150 each. They are, in my mind, clearly the greatest Syrah or Shiraz ever made in Western Australia. And um, and not I don't put them amongst the greatest that this country's ever seen, but they're wonderful wines. They're lighter, beautifully textured, serious length, placid, but fine lingering flavours. This one, as you said a second ago, had plenty of tannin, more so I think than the two previous vintages, because it's only been, this is only the third vintage. Um, I love the style, love where they're going. I'm a proponent. Um, this style is the future of Western Australian Shiraz, in my opinion. I agree. I was thinking of so many things while you were talking then. Um, and I, it, I just always come back to the region and the dirt and what it is capable of. And I think that this wine, when I was tasting it while you were talking and thinking and agreeing, there's just such a mineral undercurrent of ferrous tannin and I know I said that about Hunter but I see some similarities. Hunt, um, uh, Franklin is far more kind of rugged than the Hunter in terms of the tannin profile but it has that same bloody vein through it but I just I love that you know I love what they're doing and they um they have Muved in the ground as well which I'm really glad about because I really like Muved. Actually the best um you know my founding experience for Great Muved was with the 2002 Picked because they did a museum release in like 2010 or 11 and I bought a lot of it and drank it all and loved it, which is their um, straight Mataro. And anyway, yeah, love Muved. So they have some Muved wines coming, which if you haven't tasted them, they're really excellent and, and a revelation because, um, again, it's, a, it's sort of a new high tide mark for WA and the variety, which is really cool. I just can. Uh, some of the great producers in Nerf to Pap put out small batches of um, uh, not individual varietals, but uh, other than mainstream varietals, dominant um, in some of their releases. Morvedra or Mataro is one of them with some of the people. I reckon it's their best release. I reckon it's their best Shadow Nerf to Pap releases. I reckon some of them are great. And I love the Swinney Morvedra as well, which is about 50 bucks a bottle, I think. Awesome. I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I love me it. too. Yeah. I've been sort of at Matt for years to 
more, yep. more Mufed, more Mufed. He did it. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah just I love it. Um, Grange, 2018 Grange, 14 and a half percent, sourced from all around South Australia, maybe elsewhere, but South Australian wine. Um, and you can smell it. I mean, smelling through these wines, they're so they're so different. I mean, you get this pure kind of fruit expression and mineral overtones in the in the tyrols, and you move into the run rig and it's all charry, resinous oak and licorice, aniseed, dark chocolate, cocoa, all that sort of stuff. You go into the farby and it's it's much more placid. You get kind of mineral, kind of metal shavings and rust and blood and ironstone and black fruit. And then you get to the grange and it's just toasted coconut and oak, lots of oak. And there's fruit there for sure. But I reckon, we, now we've had these bottles on the table. We've been talking a lot. We've had them on the table nearly two hours, a bit more. And if anything, I feel like this is only just starting to crest the hill of aeration. Like I would definitely, definitely be decanting this for many hours before you open it. Because if anything, the, the oak has come out more in that two hours. And I would expect it to go the other way. So I reckon it's still got a little while to go before it's ready to, ready to drink. Now, don't tell Erin. But before I drove down here today, I opened up many of these and ran through them on my own, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, forward and backwards, but I really wanted to get a handle on them. Um, I reckon people point wines for different reasons. I was with a guy, a, a great wine lover yesterday when we looked at some great white burgundies, and he chose one and I chose another. He said the one that he chose had greater length of flavour. I'm pretty into length of flavour. I'm pretty sure the other one, which is a 2015 Domaine La Fleve, uh, Pucelles, the best of their Premier Cruise, um, I thought it was far longer, far more elegant, and I far preferred it. So everyone has different styles. Uh, Aaron and I have different styles. Some of the greatest wine writers in Europe have different preferences for exact, uh, of, from exactly the same wines. Um, in this instance, I tried this this morning and it's been brilliantly reviewed. Half a dozen people, uh, four or five people in Australia have given a hundred points and a number overseas, including some of the biggest names in the world of wine writing, have given it a hundred points. I personally love it. It's rich, it's dense, it's restrained, it has all the oak characters that Aaron was talking about, they're all there, but more restrained than they've been in the past, unless the word that you used a little while ago was idiosyncratically Australian, less idiosyncratically um, Penfolds, uh, a marvellous wine, a great length, great power, very, very young, um, perhaps, I'd have to stop back and think back a little, um, but perhaps the youngest of the Grangers I've seen in recent times on release appears to be the youngest. Um, massive staying potential. Um, Aaron talked about breathing, and it's so it's actually been breathing since about nine o'clock this morning. Okay, that takes and, us uh, and it's six, now about six two hours. o'clock. Yep. Yeah, and then um, and in Australia, and Aaron and I talk about these things from time to time. So I think we're the, under the same agreement. There are many of our wine friends, and most of our friends are wine fanatics. Um, there are many of our wine friends who would say, if you open that style of wine, that big, rich, intense, quite heavily oaked style, um, you open them the night before or in the morning and decant them, put them back in the bottle and then serve them that night. They'll be better than if you opened a bottle at the same time and poured them together. So that is getting better and better as it goes. Um, I love the style. I've loved it for decades. And um, because it's a generational thing in my family. My father had a great cellar of Grange too. And from the time that we were 12, we were given about that much wine, if you can see that, about that much wine to look at every night at the table and we were expected to talk about it. Um, it's generational. I love the style and it could be just the fact that I'm used to it. I believe that Pen the Penfolds winemaking team with their Chardonnays and their Syrah and their Cabernets and the various uh, their various labels that they do, which are increasing in number at the very top end of the market because they've got access to serious quantities of very, very good fruit. I believe that they are the greatest winemakers in Australia, and I believe that in the last few years, their wines have never been so good. They were great in the past. Regard, grains, um, 
not Michael Broadbent, Hugh Johnson, um, said that it was many, many years ago, said that Grange was the Southern Hemisphere's only first growth. And um, it was the big name in Australian, in Australian wine for decades and perhaps for a couple of generations. And I reckon they've got better. I've reviewed this wine both for Wine Advocate and in a video, and I'll post the video link below. I had Peter Gago here, um, and we discussed the new release wines, including the 18 Grange. And I think that vintage-wise, 18 was an excellent year, and we see that red-fruited clarity in this 18 vintage. Um, and in that scoring video that I released a couple of weeks ago, again, the link is down below, I talked about the difference between quality and style. And so... In terms of quality, this is an extraordinary wine. We know that it ages 50 or 60 years and beyond. Um, we know that there's heaps of oak, but there's also heaps of fruit. It's got a really clear um, um, story to it. Quality is very good. So for that reason, it gets a very high score. When we talk about stylistically what we want to drink, what I, the royal we, what I want to drink, I'm more inclined, <laughs> I'm more inclined personally to be drinking a lower alcohol, finer, medium bodied wine because I like the detail and the precision that that brings. That does not make it right. It just means that that is exactly what I like to drink. So stylistically, this is too big for me. But in terms of a quality rating, it's extraordinarily high. So there is a difference there. And we talk, I really went into detail in that scoring video about the difference between those two things. We should move on. We've got the 2018 Wendery Shiraz from Clare Valley, 13.5%. This is a really important wine to conclude, I think, because when we talk about quality Australian Shiraz, people always go to these two wines. That's totally cool. They're great. Um, they are. They've earned their position. But the story is so much broader and, and more detailed than just those two wines. And so that's why I brought, you know, a Hunter wine. Um, that's why there's a, a Wendery. This is a cult wine. So... Um, Tony and Lita Brady in Clare Valley, um, you can only buy this wine off their mailing list. In order to get on the mailing list, you have to write them a handwritten letter, um, which then gets filed and included in the, the allocation mailer um, when it's appropriate, either when someone leaves the mailing list or um, if there's space. I was there in October, I judged at the Clare Valley show and I had dinner with them. Um, and Tony, I will tell you this quick story because Tony said, do you want a taste? And I was like, I would love to. And so, he, so he's like, what do you want to taste? I was like, you know, whatever you think. And a little bit later on, he's like, so do you want to taste? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. What do you want to taste? What, whatever you reckon. He asked me a third time, and I, like, you know, over the course of sort of two hours. And I was like, I'm not being rude. I know I'm being rude when I'm not giving you a specific answer. But I'm, I'm kind of intimidated, which is weird for me because I, I see so many, you know, winemakers and, and wineries. But I didn't come here to taste. I came here to meet you and to kind of just be part of that you know um so so of course I'm like deeply honored that we can taste but I don't want to impose and and say yes I'd like to taste all these things he was like oh why don't you just say so let's go so we went to the winery and tasted all these beautiful things from tank because they store them in tank until they classify them blend them and then put them into barrels so it was a hugely illuminating um, experience for me on a number of different levels, but the one that was most important, I think, which I'd like to talk about here in the context of this wine, is the inherent character of the Wendery wines when they are young. Because when I tried them at such an inchoate stage, 2021 wines, um, in 2022, they um, have this essence of Wendery about them that can sometimes taper over time, but I got the essence of it then, and so I'm going to tell you what that tastes like. And for me, it was this rose petal character, like the, <coughs> like the you know, a fresh garden rose, really aromatic and, and beautiful. Um, the petals themselves have a character. And this, these wines have this, this like rose petal, minerals, a little bit graphite, there's rust and blood. They're very clean, pure, sparkling sort of wines. And in the mouth now, um, very sedate and restrained and quite back palate, you know, Okay, so two of the wines here have full recommended retail prices of over $1,000. Another one's a little over $500. Another one's around about $400. And the others aren't cheap. Um, this wine that Erin has chosen to put in, firstly, it's got a cult following, almost not like nothing else in the country. Um, in the big reviews and the big rankings, such as Langton's, 
I think it's in the very top range, and I think I might have two or three wines in there. So the world wants them. Australia wants them. The wine lovers want them. They're prepared to pay an enormous amount for them. And uh, if you were going to buy this from the winery, what sort of price would you pay for it? Oh, I think it's $60 a bottle. And so sixty dollars for some people is their um, is their second or third range wine. Yet this is one of the most sought after wines in the country, and they're selling it for that sort of price for cellar door. So some people may be grabbing it at cellar door and then um, or from their mail order list. Oh yeah, you can't then, get it. There's no cellar door. You can't no get tastings. it. No tastings. No. Yeah. So they, and then maybe even putting it into auction. So they've got to be careful. But. Um, um, yeah, that's not frown. That's frowned upon, I think. Uh, it oh, happens, I, I believe totally. But that secondary yeah. market. If they is... found out, that would shut you down. Yeah, yeah. So at this stage, um, it's it's it has less volume, I think, than each of the other ones here. It's understated, but it's also what a fifteenth or even a twentieth of the price of a twentieth of the price of some of these. Quite extraordinary, and yet it's regarded. Um, and re the, the word that Aaron and I were talking about before, it's revered in the same way as, as some of these others are. It's quite an extraordinary wine. And um, and those rose petal characters and the density that's in there, I hadn't noticed it until you mentioned it. I went and looked at it then. I agree totally with Aaron's terminology, but I hadn't picked up on it at the time. Um, Yes, another outstanding wine and great value for money and good that we included it in it, I think. I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I will do a Wendery vertical or horizontal or something at some point, but I have next to none of the bottles. So it's really going to determine, going to be determined by when I can buy some more and then I'll open them, which I feel like is really altruistic. But anyway, um, moving into the sixth wine, because we do have to get moving. This is the 2017 Henschke Hill of Grace from the, from the Hill of Grace Vineyard in the Eden Valley, which is obviously a zone of the Barossa zone. So Barossa Valley, Eden Valley, Barossa zone. And um, Eden Valley is a really evocative and beautiful place. And I always talk about it on these videos and it might be repetitive, but it's it's got this old Australia feel. I mean, these gorgeous, gorgeous, old, big gums and kind of boulders that sort of come out of the earth all over the place. It's just got this kind of magical feel about it. It's quite severe and the wines are quite severe. Uh, and I like that too. They've got a gorgeous mineral graphite vein. Now this, um, for me, 2017 um, was cool. Uh, I didn't, I found the quality to be quite up and down across the board from South Australia when it came to the 17 vintage. And for me, this wine um, is just so savoury. There's like ham hock and pan, like pan juices and enoki mushroom and soy sauce and truffles and meat, you know, meat so for me it's a little savory and a, a little um dry i suppose but gorgeous finesse of tannin i think that's the old vines right it's yeah it's beautiful beautiful structure but um not my preferred vintage for the flavors that it delivers okay I know he's got a separate thought on it uh, uh, we're proud each to have our own <laughs> thoughts on the wines and we stick to them as you'll already know if you've seen any of the videos before and I, I repeat that some of the greatest wine writers in the English language in Europe um, in, in the English language have polarised views on exactly the same wines from the same vintages. Um, there's nothing wrong with having your own opinion and sticking to it and always do. No one else should tell you what's a good wine. Work it out for yourself um, and practice it. You get, uh, you get uh, better at everything you practice. Uh, in this instance, yes, um, I am a fan of this wine. Now, Erin um, has a way of using words, and she has a wine vocabulary and a way of putting, weaving the words together that I don't have. Um, and my generation didn't use the terms that she used a few seconds ago, such as pan juices, enoki mushrooms, um, meat, and the first one you used was... Soy sauce? Yeah, you used soy sauce. Ham with hock. Ham hock. Uh, now, but as soon as I picked it up and started smelling, mm, that is there. Hmm, that's there too. Hmm, that's it. But my generation had never got used to those. I think you've summed it up really well. I think it's very good. Now, but so um, I know that this is more overtly flavoured in those areas than, uh, than previous vintages, but I'm a very, well, you know I'm not a very forgiving man, but um, in this instance, I'm a forgiving man. Um, I believe, I reckon that everyone likes wines for different reasons. So I reckon if you've got a Grange, you like it because of the power, the strength, the structuring, the great power, the density, and those tannins down either side, something like our version of Chateau Latour. If, um, if you, you could have a rich, dense, intense, deeply coloured DRC, Pinot Noir, 
we get a fine, elegant, fragrant, wafting Pinot Noir from another great Grand Cru vineyard. There's all different flavours and characters. You can have a great Chateau Chem, which I'm sure Erin drinks that far a lot more of than she should. Got some uh, for dinner uh, tonight, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, which is just unctuous and seamless. But th they're not the things that make a great wine, in my opinion. My view is that the thing that makes a great wine is length of flavour. This has got length of flavour in Robbie Hillsmith terms in spades. This has those characters that Erin's talking about, which I think are a little bit overt, but I'm forgiving of those because you've got that flavour initially, those flavours up here, but then by the time you get to the middle palate, it's becoming longer, leaner, lingering, silky textured, and just lingers and lingers and lingers and just gradually dances and drifts away. And I love that. I'm into the length of flavour, so I'll forgive the slight the overt nature of the characters that you're talking about um, and uh, and think it's absolutely marvellous. I, I love this wine. Erin's um, already discussed the vintage to an extent. For a vintage that wasn't great, it's a triumph for the vintage. Quite possibly the best wine, quite possibly, I'm not saying it is because I'd need to stop and really think about that and look at some of our tasting notes, uh, could be the best wine of the vintage out of that general region. And I'd also say that, um, and Erin and I have talked about this before as well, the Hill of Graces in the past were truly wonderful. When I was young, they were great. They were, you know, my dad just loved them. They were the first wines I sold from the 1970 vintage. But, um, you didn't know I was that old, did you? Uh, but the um, more recently, despite the fact that during the 80s, the 90s, the noughties, the wines were fantastic. They were great. Right now, they have never been as good. I've said to Aaron previously that I reckon the 2015 isn't the great half dozen Australian reds I've ever tried. That was exquisite. Tyson Stelter, who Aaron used to work with at the Wine Companion and who's one of the, the great names in Australian wine, he says he believes the 16 is better. I don't. I'll stick with the 15. But, um, I'll also so I, stick with the 15. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I reckon Henschke too have never done better. The wines are truly great. And I know this isn't the greatest of all of them, because of the characters that Aaron's talking about and because of that slightly less vintage, but under the circumstances, brilliant wine. I love it, and I'll love it in the years to come. I'm sure you're probably right about the years to come bit. I think it will age beautifully. Um, in the final glass, we've got the 2018 Clarendon Hills Australis, which is from Clarendon in McLaren Vale. Um, and this is a really interesting wine because like all of them, they are evolving and changing over time. And certainly this one is coming together a little better than it has previous um, because when we looked at it together earlier, I said it was it's very ripe. It is ripe. It's 14.7% alcohol. Um, but it tastes ripe as well. It's got like a plum pudding, short crust pastry, jam sort of character to it. But actually now as it's breathing, the tannins are sort of rising through that and it's becoming more of a savoury wine, which is very cool because it is quite sweet. The style of um, Australis is opulent and luxe, and I've used the word sybaritic um, quite a bit in tasting notes to describe some of these sorts of wines. Sybaritic, uh, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great word. It's kind of got sexual overtones, but it essentially refers to like um, lush, opulent, um, voluminous, generous sort of characters, right? And that's what that style of Australis is over the years. That's what it is. I mean, it's garnered... I don't know the number, but many 100-point scores. Um, and actually, interestingly, I know I'm talking a lot, but interestingly, while I was there in um, no, you're not. in June, um, uh, we looked at, I tasted with Roman and Alex, and we looked at the 20, there was no 19, um, the 18, the 17, and the 90, I can't remember if it was 94 or 96, but it was the first labelled Australis. Um, and I liked the 20 the most. Like, I don't know, it was a very hot year. Maybe they picked it a bit earlier. It had a bit more restraint, very fresh. I loved it. But to me, it was a, a little shift in the right direction from, from the 18, which felt ripe then and feels ripe now. You know. I know you're taking breath at all then, but just wait. Um, <laughs> um, when, <laughs> when we looked at the old Australis... Do I do what I'm told? Roman um, opened it and he was like, just wait. Just, he's just going like this. Hold on. And he wanted to make sure if it was right to taste. So Alex and I are like, and he's like, just, just wait. And we're kind of like, just hold on. 
pretty good now. <laughs> now you can go. <laughs> and it, you know, we were there maybe like five minutes, maybe ten minutes. Oh. He's sort of just sitting in this on this bench overlooking the vineyard waiting. Um, but it was a beautiful wine and it, it sort of shows that it had moved into this um, really lovely Pinot place. You know, like a truffly Pinot sort of space. It was very light and... Anyway, gorgeous. Definitely a great, um, a great example of, of an aged Australis and why aging Shiraz can take it into a really beautiful and new place. Okay. Now, many, many years ago, when I was young, at one stage I did a tasting of the 1978 Bordeaux's and the Bordeaux's were fantastic. The 79s came out and they were very good as well. I did tastings over here in Western Australia, lined up 15 or 20 of them at a time, charged people to come along and the people loved them. Now, I don't recall what vintage it was. It might have been 80 or 81. I did it the following year as well. And the wines were really disappointing and, um, and as, as compared to what we'd seen. And I said um, to the room, because I sell what I believe in in our retail stores and our restaurants, I said, guys, if I was you, I wouldn't buy any of these. I'm disappointed in these. And someone said, well, why on earth have you put them on? I said, if all you ever do was all you ever did was look at the great wines, how would you, how would you know that they were good wines if you, unless you tried lesser wines as well? So I think it's very important that you see both sides. So in this instance, the last tasting of these wines, of some of these wines, the key wines here that Aaron and I did, we looked at the 2015 and 2016 vintages. Great vintages for Shiraz. I'm going to put the link to that video down in the link as well because if you haven't seen that, it's quite a cool intro to this because we look at the Australis, the Hill of Grace and the Grange. We look at the Laird from Torbrek and the Powell and Sons Stein at Flaxman's from Eden. So th that's a cool um, thing to look at if you haven't seen it yet. With great information and the wines are very good. Now, some of these from 17, some of these are from 19, not quite as good of vintages and I think it shows to an extent. Um, I've said that the Henschke from 17 was a triumph for the vintage, but it's not as good as 15 and 16. I don't think in um, in terms of quality. Now, I'm a little bit that way on this guy. I just, it's, um, so over the years, um, Australis has wowed the world. It's um, only about, I spoke to Alex. Alex is coming to Perth to host tasting for us on a couple of occasions. And, um, uh, Alex Bratasiak, who from the family who own it and, and make the wines, um, uh, he said they make about 17,000 cases, of which 1,000 dozen only are sold in Australia. All the rest is sold overseas because the reputation overseas is extraordinary. It's fantastic. In America, the, um, um, the Australis, and I don't recall the exact periods, but a, a five-year period, a 10-year period, and a 15-year period, which I looked at some years ago, four or five years ago, just to get context. I was looking for the context. Um, I averaged the points over that period of time. They averaged higher points in Grange and higher points in Hill of Grace, which are Australia's flag bearers overseas. So it's an extraordinary achievement. The wines were bigger, softer, rounder, incredibly complex, great length, wonderful finishes, wonderful aftertaste, um, almost opulent, but all in balance, flowing, not quite the richness perhaps of run rig and that slight viscosity that comes perhaps from the Viognier or you might think of other things, but nevertheless, truly great wines. I think that this is a wonderful wine, um, but I think that 15 and 16 are pretty good. And given that Erin says, which she did say a couple of minutes ago, and we're gonna hold it to it, that um, the 20, she had a good look at, she thinks it's slightly better. I'm looking forward to see that come out. So when do you reckon that will be coming out? I don't know. I, th th I think it's released, but I don't know. Oh. But I don't know. Like. Okay, we'll check it out though, but great news. Yeah. If, um, if it is out there now, and given Aaron's thoughts on it compared to the others, which are great, um, it'll be worthwhile seeking out and going for. Uh, I love the style, and um, this finish is very good. It's a very, very good wine. Not my favourite in this lineup, and um, and I've seen better. There's some stiff competition here. Is Absolutely. I <laughs> and, but not my greatest vintage of Australia server, but not far behind it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Epic wines. Um, <laughs> this is, I know. I know. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do already because we have, um, we have, I have so many more things coming up this year. 2023 is going to be big uh, and you wouldn't want to be the last to know about it. Are we allowed to talk very briefly about New Zealand? Sure. I mean, the announcement should be happening today, so it will probably happen this week. So this might even be a forward announcement, but um, 
I'm going to take over reviewing New Zealand for the Wine Advocate. Should have been as of the 2nd of January, which is today. Uh, so we'll see um, where that goes. But it's going to be a big, a big year full of great wine. So for both Australia and New Zealand and also for Erin Larkin. We can include La Colina in this. That great, have you had that great? No. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's some great Syrah in New Zealand. Really great. God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you.